Thank you, good afternoon. Uh, trust you can all hear me at the back. Um, the first question I wanted to ask is, I'm an archaeologist, I'm just trying to find out how many of you are. So, show of hands who are archaeologists? Right, good. <laughs> um, no, I need a question. Okay. My paper's called Against <coughs> Time. I must apologise because I've now changed the title to Against Time rather than Against Instance. Won't have time, certainly with the pressure that we've got to talk about the Neolithic example. Um, this is where I'm starting from, is how do we consider time? Just as time with different sorts of time held within, for example, Ricoeur's phenomenological and cosmological time, where dialectics shuttle in between the two to hold time together. Surely time is universal, all-embracing, in order to c contain these dialectics. It breaks down. In Five Bells, Kenneth Slesser explores his lover's suicide, drowned in Sydney Naval Harbour, 1932. Time that is moved by little fidget wheels is not my time, the flood that does not flow, between the double and the single bell of a ship's hour, between a round of bells from the dark warship riding there below. I have lived many lives, and this one life of Joe, long dead, who lives between five bells. It's just the start of a great poem. However, it's not Auden's stop all the clocks. For Slesser, there are no clocks. No argument except time can never be at one with itself. Which means that there is not necessarily one time. Hold on, let me go back a bit. I can. I can't see the light. <laughs> uh, it is not universal, not a single time, regardless how it's comprised or categorised, but rather there are an indeterminate set of times. I'll give an example. Suppose a toddler asks, what time is it? You know what time it is, sweetie pie. Time for bed. The child may have no concept of clocks, seasons, probably only day or night. Yet both child and parents understand the child's view of time and know that they share understanding. Laurel, our daughter, would pull off our blankets and sleepy heads with the words, morning time. As adult clock watchers, we state the child has yet to develop a full sense of time, a layered sense of time, cannot tell the time. Once Laurel does, we can say, go back to bed, it's only five o'clock. But is this right? On what grounds may we say Laurel's parents' view of time is more exact, more true than Laurel's? It goes round in circles. It is more correct, more true, because it holds more within. And because it holds more within, it is more correct, more <coughs> true. A tautology, and even if it weren't, it could be more correct, more true, because it holds less within. Archaeology. How can, or dare we, as archaeologists, <coughs> state that our own view of time is at least as correct as times of those we study? Worse, by taking this for granted, we deny ourselves opportunity to reveal unknown epistemologies, to so share understanding, <coughs> including time from the archaeological times from the archaeological record. So these unknown epistemologies. It's thrilling to discover these. What other discipline may, from material remains, reveal worlds of time otherwise gone forever? This is archaeologists' right and duty. Discover their loss, or, in the words of Spock, <coughs> If Star Trek were a field trip, it's time, Jim, but not as we know. <laughs> oh. Sorry, I'm going the wrong way. <laughs> there we go. This is an example. It's uh, about medieval field systems. This is Royal Alaska, and you can tell because there's a bloke with a top hat. <coughs> it's horse racing, the sport of kings. You can see, if you're not in a pitch now, do a turf, this sign here, the half sign, is half a furlong. So a half a furlong till the red edge finishing post, winning post, there. Um, 
just hold on, I can use this. There we go. Can you see that? That's the winning post. Uh, where are we? Which, as you can see, is about 100 metres between the half to the winning post, which is why the jockeys are jockeying as much, giving it some with the whips, to get as much speed as they can dare from their nags. Nags. It's soon to be glue, closely followed by Knacker's Yard, with Tarpan bringing up the rest of the field. So, I like horse racing. <laughs> what has this got to do with archaeology? More specifically, Anglo-Saxon archaeology. This sign denotes four of these stitches, and more archaeologically, a communal field system, which overlooks... The Atlantic, here we are, you can see this. This is in Cornwall, North Atlantic coast there. This is the field system, this is your all archaeologist. You can probably see the reverse S going around there, and this is also a reverse S. Difficult taking things with a mobile phone, and they're taking two layers of hail fat twice in a year, and this is on to fallow. Right, as you can see, there's the sinuous reverse S at the back. These are seed to furlongs from the furlongs. So furlongs, hold on, can we go back one? There's the furlong markers. And a furlong, I'm sorry if you all know this, is commonly 220 yards or roughly a reasonable distance for a team of oxen to draw a plough allowing turning arcs at each end. So you've got a reverse S, which we showed you, which is why English roads wind and you get the so on and so <coughs> forth. How, however, although her furlongs are pretty well um, defunct outside horse racing, I pre um, you can appreciate that we tend to use them as archaeologists now. Whoops, wrong way again. Keep going. Okay, we're going to talk from furlongs to an acre. An acre is 0.404686 hectares, or immensely more exact, a furlong, what we've just seen, 220 yards in length, by four perches, or two chains, or a cricket wicket, 22 yards, which is quite interesting. Um, here is the critical part. An acre is said to be the amount a plough team will plough in a day. An acre is therefore a measure of time, at least as much of space, whereas a hectare, still less 0.40486 hectares, is no measure of time at all. It is this God's hectare, and it does make sense. The rusting sign here lies up against the church, overlooking Forabu stitches. This is a philosophical bit. From this it follows that an acre denotes an epistemology at one with space-time. Our own epistemology is based on space and time being wholly separate. We have problems with relativistic physics. We just do. And one, one wonders why. There may be time without space, space without time. For example, carbon-14 dates never mind radioactivity decay rates, make no reference to space at all. Whereas this is space-time. Forabee stitches is purely material, evidential, empirical. From the point of view of archaeological theory, ideas which predicate archaeological practice, the theory predicates the practice, or what you might call meta-archaeology, it means that empirical approach provides, this is an empirical approach providing access to different worlds of time. So what I'm saying there is that by finding this concept of space-time, it's an empirical measure. It's not simply phenomenological. It may not even be phenomenological. Yet in even to consider, commence consideration of such an empirical approach, it pre-requires acknowledgement there is not a single universal set time. It's like you have, we've been talking about layers of time within a universe of time, but an indeterminate set of times, times without number. Otherwise, Anglo-Saxon space-time is lost. Without doing this, we wouldn't be talking about an Anglo-Saxon space-time. Whether the phenomenological may also achieve this on its own is a separate question. This is, I think, fairly empirical. I can't say that, but I think probably not. More critically, 
Why ask the question when the empirical already suffices? Once different worlds of time are established, the phenomenological is perhaps more suited to exploring the differences between them as it does in layered time. The empirical and phenomenological go hand in hand, rather like when I did archaeology back in the 70s, there was quite a lot of intellectual arm wrestling. How they go hand in hand is perhaps a good place to start the discussion. All I wish to state for sure is empiricism is required to establish these di different worlds of time, discover their loss. Thank you. I've tried to be as quick <coughs> as I can. And can I just go? Oh. <coughs> I was just going to put my. How do I? It's probably it's probably it's probably. There you are. What I was going to say, there's my address, if you wanted it. Barl needs to come to talk to me afterwards. I don't belong to any university, I've just retired from a different career. And if you like, I can also send you the one involving me in the study circle. Thank you very much.